Welcome to World of Marketing Podcast, a Foster Web Marketing production. Here's your host, Tom Foster. Hey, everybody, it's Tom Foster in the World of Marketing, and I am super excited to be here with my good buddy, Jason Abraham. Jason Abraham is no small potato. Jason Abraham, well, you're a small potato. You know, you've thinned up over the years since I first met you. I have, thankfully. I was a lot fatter back then. There's some videos of that, too. I lost, I think I lost about an 11-year-old boy, and I feel so good about it. Oh, man, that's funny. There's some good pooper reels of that. Yeah, exactly. So, Jason is with Hupy and Abraham, which is uh, in a giant plane of personal injury firm in uh, Milwaukee. That's the primary spot, but you're also in Illinois? Yep. In Iowa? Correct. And you you went out to Iowa a couple years ago, right? Yeah, we did. And you have, and let's see, you've been with us for since 2009, so a long time. Yeah. I thank you for that, by the way. And I thank you. I mean, you've been a big part of our success, and we're grateful for all you and your team do. It's been an awesome partnership. Yeah, and you got a great team as well, Jill. You know, I know that's your secret weapon. I won't even say her last name out loud. Yeah, shh. (laughs) That's classified. It's what? It's classified. I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. (laughs) She's done a great job. And you've got a great team over there. And... um, so tell me before I get it, because obviously we're doing this, you're, it, well, you're, you're back to work. You're, and we'll get to that. Yeah. We never just, left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still sheltered. We're in Virginia, you know, like I'm in my bunker, which happens to also be my music studio. So it ain't too bad. Yeah. But uh, we're in Virginia. We don't get to open back up again until June. Um, so I think that they're marching the state capitol here too, like they are in Michigan, so whatever. We'll, we'll get to all that stuff. But So Jason, you're a pretty young guy and you run this firm. And you got, you got started with the firm back in what, 1993? I did, yeah, 1993. Seems like 7,000 years ago, but 1993. So tell me, tell everybody a little bit about your background. How did you become, because I know your story, but I want you to share it with everybody else. Why did you become a lawyer? Why did you become a personal injury lawyer? You know, and then how did you get involved uh, with Michael Hupe at Hupe and Abraham? Yeah, thanks. You know, first, I just want to say thanks for having me here. I'm, I'm so excited to be with you. You know, I love you and the stuff we're doing. And I've got a big smile on my face. I know people won't be able to see it, but, you know, it's just exciting to me to be here with you and talking about this stuff and trying to inspire others because my story for me, you know, I've always been a big dreamer and I know you and I've talked about this, but I never could have dreamed as big uh, as, as we've become. And, you know, the first thing you have to say when you are successful, or the first thing you should say when you're successful like me is it's really based on so much hard work from so many other people. And I think one of the reasons why I've been so successful and we've been so successful is because uh, I'm humble about the success. And and that's just so important when you're trying to inspire your staff um, and just create something awesome. And we have just created something awesome here at Hubie and Abraham. And I can remember back when I was Uh, 10 years old, and I'd said that I wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't really know what that meant, but my dad was a lawyer. He was a real estate lawyer at a big firm. My grandfather was a lawyer, um, and he was ended up being kind of a criminal lawyer. He he graduated from law school, and then our family started uh, the Midwest's biggest dry cleaning company. So he stopped practicing law and did that for a number of years. And when they sold it, uh, actually the year I was born, it ended up being the biggest dry cleaning uh, company in the Midwest. And then he went back to practicing law and just was kind of a dabbler in this and that just to kind of um, pass the time. He, he finally retired at the uh, insistence of my dad and myself when he was in his uh, 80s uh, because we actually didn't want him working on anything anymore because you can only imagine when you're 80 years old and you want to dabble in this and dabble in that, nothing good's going to happen. 
but I just wanted to be a lawyer because they were lawyers. And, and I really didn't know what it meant, but starting at the age of 10, I just kept saying, I, when someone asked me, well, what do you want to do with your life? I said, I wanted to be a lawyer. And uh, probably wasn't until law school that I really understood what that was going to mean for me, but it, it was my dream. And I can remember I was interviewed uh, because I was in this club called DECA and I was interviewed and they said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I wanted to be a lawyer. And they said, well, God, there's so many lawyers. And my response to them back then when I was in middle school was, yeah, but there's always room for another good lawyer. And, and that's just kind that's of that's good. the philosophy that I took at a young age that I wanted to do it. I really didn't know what it meant, but I never wavered from that. And so uh, all through grade school, high school, uh, even going to college, I met with some lawyers at my dad's firm and asked them, what should I major in? And I learned, you know, it really didn't matter your major, it more mattered your grade point average and just find something you're passionate about. And, and I was enjoyed, I took some psychology courses as a freshman and I really enjoyed them. So I decided I'd be a psychology major because I enjoyed it. And, you know, I think that's really helped me dealing with people and clients and and so then I graduated from the University of Wisconsin in Madison in 1985. And then I immediately went to law school at Marquette and, and just kind of followed my dream. When I graduated in uh, 92, it was a very, very difficult time to find a job. And I was just grateful to find a job as a trial lawyer doing criminal work. Um, I knew that wasn't gonna be my passion, but I knew I wanted to be in the courtroom and do trial work. And so that got me in the courtroom immediately. I was at a boutique firm. We represented mostly drunk drivers and drug dealers. And I had my first jury trial within a month of law school. And it just, wow. I, I just loved it. I was scared. It was terrifying. The senior partner at the firm who I really respected came and watched. And, and the one lesson I always remembered, I tell all my young lawyers, and when I talk at law schools now, I, I talk about it is on your very first trial, you get the opportunity to tell the jury that this is your first trial. And, and you only get that opportunity once because you know you're gonna screw something up. And, and boy, <laughs> you end up screwing up a lot of things. But I, so I, you know, the, and the judge thinks it's funny and the other, you know, the prosecutor kind of thought it was funny, but I said to the jury while I was picking the jury, you know, this is my first trial and I know I'm gonna screw some things up here. And can you promise me that you won't hold it against my client? Uh, when I make a mistake and you know you can see the smiles and you, it's just kind of an endearing thing that you get to do in your first trial and sure enough it was a drunk driving and I'll never forget it you know I, I spent all this time and the police officer you know back then and I'm sure now I haven't done any of that stuff in god 25 years it's a cookie cutter report where you probably used the report from the case before and just changed some details so I went out to the scene, I took pictures, I did all this stuff. It was my first trial. I was so excited I was gonna win. And I went out there and the police officer's report said that my client cost crossed the center line. And I went out there and there was no center line. So I'm like, ha ha, I'm gonna get him. And then uh, in the report, it also said that my client went over on the gravel shoulder and all this gravel flew up and I looked over and there was no gravel shoulder. And I'm like, oh, he's lying through his ASS. And I don't know if I can swear on your podcast. You can say whatever you want here. Okay. Uh, I was lying through his ass, you know, and I was so excited as a 22 year old lawyer, uh, actually 25 year old lawyer, I was just going to kill this guy and I was going to win and I was going to hold up all these pictures and this was going to be great and I'm going to come back to the firm and everyone's going to be so proud of Jason won his first trial. And, and so I go and I and I'm just chopping at the bit to pull out my pictures and cross the cop and, and I grab my pictures and it's my turn to cross examine and I grab my pictures and I go right up to the witness without saying anything to the judge or the other uh, lawyer. And the judge says, well, Jason, aren't you gonna ask permission to not only approach the witness and or show these pictures and this or that. And I'm, you know, the jury starts laughing because, you know, it was the first mistake and they wanted me to make a mistake. And I, you know, I was hammering all this stuff home. And the gist of it is, as you can imagine, I lost the case and I couldn't believe I lost the case because goddamn, these pictures showed he was lying and what the heck. And, but I knew right then I was hooked. And, and being a trial lawyer was gonna be what I was gonna be. Uh, it wasn't gonna be a criminal trial lawyer. I really wanted to be a personal injury trial lawyer because I wanted to make a difference uh, with those type of people. Nothing wrong with being a criminal lawyer. I've done it. I know how hard it is. I know that it's a great career choice. I have friends that do it, but it just wasn't gonna be my passion. 
And so I was lucky enough a year after um, I started at that firm to be able to uh, get a job with Mike Hupe. So I was a 26 year old guy and hungry and we had a small personal injury firm in Milwaukee. I think when I started, there was a total of about 18 people. And the rest is, is um, a story like Disney World, as far as I'm concerned with, with where we've gone. It's interesting that you told, I, thank you for sharing that story about your first trial, because um, it kind of reminds me of when I first got into this into the legal business because before I did websites, I did trial presentation for lawyers and uh, did, so I basically went into the courtroom with you guys and showed the, like what you said, the pictures, uh, the discovery, the videos. And I would be the, like, I would get reams and boxes of discovery stuff. And I'd be like, man, this is a shoe in. This is like, you're gonna crush it. And I'd be building this case and then I would sit in there and I would watch as the case would deteriorate because they could not introduce this evidence because they didn't do, you know, step four, eight, six in the proper order and whatever. And I immediately recognized the plight of a trial attorney that it is nothing like what people see on television. Yeah, nothing. Nothing. And so like that, I, I totally get that. And what, but why did you, why were you not allowed to introduce that? Were you not oh, allowed? Oh, I was, but there was just foundation I should have laid. Number one, oh, I, should see? Have, I should have just asked the judge for permission. I should have made sure that I showed the pictures. The protocol. The computer. The yeah, protocol. Just, just stuff a green lawyer fresh out of law school, pulling up his pants and tightening his belt, thinking he knows yeah. everything in the whole world is going to forget because he's just so darn excited. Then... Two different men drive up in a similar... Don't shake your head. I'm not done yet. Wait till you hear the whole thing so you can understand this now. Well, I think that I remember on one of my visits years ago and talking to Michael. And Michael Hupe, who's, who's your partner, has a, quite a reputation in Milwaukee. And as a, um, as, a, as a giver back to the community, that's one of the things that Hupe and Abraham is known for. You guys do so much uh, for the community. Um, but didn't he, like, wasn't he just super impressed with your trial attorneymanship? I, I think there's a better word for that, but yeah, he, you know, he, he found you. It, it, yeah. He, the senior partner of the firm I worked at, he had a lot of respect for because he had represented him in something. And so the fact that I was there doing trial work really gave me a leg up to get a job with him as a young green lawyer, because these jobs at PI firms, they're not easy to get, you know, the PI firms want you trained. When I'm looking for new lawyers for myself now, I really want them that they've been trained by defense firms and, and they're ready to take a case and run with it and try. But my partner, Mike Hupe, you know, he had done so much uh, great stuff, not only in the courtroom, marketing, uh, dealing with clients. I mean, he had set up a firm uh, himself, but when I joined, it had a really great path for us to follow. And as a young lawyer, he was someone that I was very lucky to be able to emulate, pick his brain, do all that kind of stuff. And then I, I'll tell you what really made me the luckiest as time went on is that he looked at a young lawyer that he would be interested in making a partner because I was told all along he would never make anyone a partner. And I kept saying to everyone, you know what, if you make yourself indispensable, he's going to have no choice but to make me a partner. And I... The, the, another piece of advice that I tell all my lawyers, and I would tell everybody listening to this podcast, I did not waste one second of energy from the day I walked in the door at this firm 26 years ago, 27 years ago, whenever it was, to today, hoping someone else didn't do well, thinking that the way I'm going to be successful is if someone else doesn't do their job right. So many people waste energy hoping that the person above them may do something wrong or, or they're not congratulating the person above them for their success because they're envious or jealous or think it's gonna stop them from getting ahead. I didn't waste one second of energy on that ever. When the people above me, and obviously I was the lowest man on the totem pole when I came here, when they did something great, I was proud that they did something great because they worked at the same firm I did. But I knew I was gonna do something great and probably something greater and I didn't need them to fail for me to shine. I wanted the firm to be successful, but I knew I was gonna shine 
based on what I brought to the table. And I realized at a young age that if I waste 15% of my time hoping someone else doesn't do well or I'm envious or I'm doing that, that's 15% more time I could have spent separating myself out, doing something great that makes me stand out. And that philosophy of always being happy when other people succeeded, but knowing that I was going to be successful, I think was one of the biggest drivers that allowed me to get where I am and also to allow Mike to allow a young guy like me to kind of manage and run the firm on the, on the trajectory that he started, that he trusted that I would do that. And just with my energy, because this is really a younger, it's a young man's game in some respects. And, you know, he's done the hard work for so many years, but to, for him to see that potential in me and then allow me to use my skills of motivating people, just my hunger to be successful, my ability to hire good people. I think another thing that I've done extremely well is I allow my key people the autonomy to do their jobs and shine. You know, when you have a firm, before COVID, I had a firm of 200 people. I'm just one person. Mike and I are two out of 200. There's not much we're gonna do as two of 200 if we do not give autonomy to key people and let them shine. And that's what I do remarkably well, is motivate my key people, let them shine. And that's what's allowed us to flourish and be the Midwest's biggest personal injury law firm. And I mean, just going back to what you were saying about, you know, you're a young lawyer and it didn't take long for Mike to make you a partner. What well, was just like, what, six years? Yeah, six years after I joined. So that, I mean, that that's a message to all the lawyers out there, what you were saying. Yeah, I mean, like, and you genuinely are that. You've always been very, you know, you've always inspired others. You know, I've known you a long time. You know, we've had a, we've had a great relationship and I've seen the way that you interact with other, with your employees. Um, I mean, you demand, you demand great things from them, you know, but you're very kind. You're very, you know, you inspire them to do better. Uh, you push them, you challenge them. Um, you know, you've got the best and you know, that's, it says a lot. And yeah. Michael, smart for Mike, smart on him to give you or to, I guess that's the best way to say it, give you the reins of the firm to help grow it. Now, when you became a partner, when did you become like the managing partner after that? I, uh, it, I think it slowly transitioned after that, but it wasn't terribly long. And Mike understood that I looked at my role as his owner, as his partner, excuse me, that my number one job was to do everything in my power to make his life easier and for him to have no stress. No. Um, I looked at it and said, this guy has done all the heavy lifting for all these decades. He has the confidence in me to make him his partner. And now my job is to take the stress off him, do everything we can do to follow his vision that I believe in and then take this thing to the next level. And together we did that, you know, for you. You allowed him to do the stuff that he loves to do, which is all the work with the bike club and the charity and all those things that he loves to do while you continue to grow. And like you said, it not biggest biggest firm in the midwest yeah it's as i said and i say it with a smile and with unbelievable humility i could have never drew tom when i say i could have never dreamed this big i could have never dreamed this big and we have a holiday party every year that's he, we bring in all of our employees from all of our offices they can bring a guest it's you know a six-figure event it's the yeah. nicest thing most of them will do all year. And when I stand there and I'm looking out at 350 people, our employees and guests, it, it's like the happiest moment of my life to think, wow, I, all these people are here working hard for us, for our clients, to make the communities better. And it is awe-inspiring to look out over the crowd and see all these mouths we feed and all the good we do. Not only do we do an amazing job of representing our clients, but Tom, we do so much in the community to make it a better place. Yeah. I mean, we, in the last five years, the owners of the firm and the employees have given over a million dollars as a, just a small starts mom and pop kind of firm we started at 
to all these different things just to make life better for people. And, and that's not even including the representation. That's a given that you're going to do that well. But it's just amazing to think that this is uh, where we've come. And I've, you know, I've been lucky. I've been up there a couple of times to interview not only you guys, but a lot of these organizations that you've helped. And I didn't know a lot of this stuff because you don't, you don't, you're not really, you're not a bragger. You don't like brag about it. You know, it's, I walked in there not knowing and uh, just sat and listened and was really just profoundly blown away by the generosity of, of what you guys have done and how much these, these communities appreciate it. And, you know, just how you go the extra mile and really just give back. Yeah, it's in our, it's in our blood. In return. Yeah, it's in our blood and, yeah. and, it's, and the employees get excited about it. And we give our employees volunteer hours so they can go out and do things in the community. So we, you know, it's, it's meaningful. And I'll tell you, if there's one thing you can do to get your employees involved in your mission, it's that. If, yeah. someone, if one of my employees has a relative that has leukemia and they want to go do the walk or go do this or that, and the firm gets behind them and they get to do it, they're so excited. And, you know, every year the employees get us a gift. And for the last two years, I mean, this is unbelievable. Our employees have raised enough money themselves in donations for the owners that we have built Habitat for Humanity homes in Iowa, Illinois, and Wisconsin as a gift from the employees to the owners. Wow. And then the gifts the owners give back is we allow our employees to go out there and do all the hard work. We get to meet the homeowners. And it's just unbelievable how you see all this that you've done in your business life be able to make a difference in somebody's life uh, by giving them a home and doing the hard work. I'm out there pounding nails and doing insulation and, and I am the most unhandy human being in the planet. And, and I'm out there getting all itchy with insulation and painting, getting on ladders, things I would never do at home. But then I see the homeowner and her handicapped daughter in Waukesha, Wisconsin this year. We, we just finished one. And, and I got to go there when she was getting the keys and get the big hug and all my employees were there. And God, it just, there's nothing that feels it's good better. to give back like that. Oh, God, does it feel good. So on another, let's just change, pivot a little bit, because one of the unique, cool things about the firm that is like, unlike any other firm, is your uh, investigators, which are, you know, they're like motorcycle dudes, like Tony. And um, I don't know if that's still going on after all this, but one of the things that I was super impressed with is like you go in there and the investigators have got ponytails and um, Harley Davidson chaps and all that kind of stuff. Well, one of the things that Mike started way before my time was getting involved with bikers. Yeah. And so, you know, we've been, that's been a, a huge focus of our practice. We've represented over 5,000 motorcyclists now. And uh, so a lot of us ride. I ride, a lot of my investigators ride. And, you know, if you're going to invest in giving back and representing people, Bikers understand who are real bikers and who are pretend bikers. And it's funny because I've been to some seminars where a group of pretend bikers, and I'm not, I'm not going to say the name, you know, they go out and they, they sell their franchise and then they pitch and they say in their advertising materials, just buy a bike and stand next to it. I know doesn't, what you're talking about. I know yeah. you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you ride or you don't ride. Well, the reality is it does matter. It does. It, it matters to people if you're going to go out there and, and really do the heavy lifting. Like we go to the legislatures and lobby for changes in laws that impact bikers. And, you know, we make sure we volunteer at things and we donate things. And, and yeah, we represent more injured bikers than I, I can't. I don't know anyone else in the country that represents more than we do. But um, you want to walk the walk and talk the talk. It's more than just throwing a commercial on TV. It, it's part of our livelihood and, it, and it's in our blood. Now, we represent way more car accident victim people than motorcycle because there's way more car accident victims than motorcycle. But and people that drive motorcycles or ride motorcycles also drive cars. So. Yeah. And it's just a group we're passionate about. And so a lot of our investigators and a lot of our lawyers and a lot of our staff ride and, and we get involved in stuff. And if we believe in it, we're going to go to the mat for it. You know, we, we just don't talk for talking. We just don't run a commercial to run a commercial. We believe in what we do. And we're passionate about the end game of doing a great thing for our clients 
but also then parlaying that into doing something even bigger uh, in the communities. And, and one other thing before I forget, because it's just on my forefront, another piece of advice that I would advise um, lawyers or anybody to do, one thing we've done is at the end of every case, we send an anonymous survey to every one of our clients to fill out. And, and we send it anonymously because we want the clients to be able to answer without feeling that they have to put their name on it because we want real feedback. I expect 99% of them to be amazing because I believe my staff is amazing. I believe we're going to dot the I's, cross the T's, and we're going to give people the service they demand and they should get. We're going to try to exceed their expectations. But you send that out without fear of what you get because you want to get the ones that aren't good to see, do you have a problem? Is there, yeah. could there be a potential staff problem? Is there something you could do better? I'm not naive enough to think just because I've been doing this a while and I've, I've represented now, believe it or not, Tom, over 70,000 people. Just because I've represented over 70,000 people doesn't mean I have all the answers. Doesn't mean we always do it right. And I wanna know when we're doing it wrong. So one thing that I would encourage every law firm business to do is do that. When you finished with your customer, your client, whatever it is, send a survey to have them send it back. They don't have to put their name on it if they don't want, you don't care if their name is on it. What you want is, and throw away all the good ones because you should expect the good ones because you should care enough about what you do, be passionate enough about it. And you should understand the customer service required to exceed a client's expectation. So throw all those away and then look at the bad ones so you can figure out what can I do better? And you can see, God forbid, you had an employee that just has fallen off the rails. Uh, right. That could happen. They could have a personal problem you don't know about. There could be any number of things that could happen. Well, if all of a sudden you get 10 bad surveys for one employee, well, you, you found something out before you lost 20 clients. Exactly. So don't be afraid to get bad information because I'm telling you right now, the studies show, and Tom, you know this better than anyone, and I'm sure my math would be wrong. A happy client may tell six people you're the greatest. An unhappy client is going to tell 40 people you suck. That's true. And you damn well want to find out about the ones that are going to say you suck and try to turn that frown upside down. And I do that in every one. We call in every one. And you may not be able to turn that into a smile, but I'll tell you one thing. Even if they're unhappy, if they know that you called enough to care about their concerns and you heard them out, you have done something to try to do that. And in the customer service business, and don't think just because you have a law degree, you're not in the customer service business. We are no different than the person selling phones at AT&T, the clients that go into Best Buy or the restaurant. As a lawyer, if you want to have a successful practice, you better understand you are no different than they are. And even more important as a lawyer, because people depend on their lawyers. I mean, like, Yeah, but it's even bigger than that, isn't it? Yeah, they, they 100% they do, but it's bigger because I think a lot of times people get this degree and they think that makes them something special. Right. Well, the degree could make you something special, but it's incumbent on you to understand that it's just a piece of paper. And yeah, you have some advanced knowledge, but you need to use that knowledge. You need to be respectful with that knowledge. You need to be humble with that knowledge because a lot of what happens with the clients, I've had clients where at the end of the day, the result wasn't what I would have liked. You know, you try your case, you never know what's going to happen. I've had clients where at the end of the day, the result, God, I wish the result would have been better. And they're just so grateful because you, you were there to take their calls. They knew you were there passionately representing them. And they understand at the end of the day, you did all you could do. And then you obviously have the other circumstance where you got this amazing result, like way more than they should ever get. And you have the client that's, you know, never going to be satisfied. Well, you run the gamut. But if you, if you understand that you work for the client. And believe me, I understand that every day. It doesn't matter uh, how big my office is, how big my piece of paper is, how big my house is. What matters is that I work for every one of my clients. They're my boss. And if you as a lawyer understand that and you treat those clients with that understanding, boy, you're gonna have a lot of happy clients and you're gonna get yourself a lot of business. That's, a, that's great advice. And especially, you know, because you do have, you know, 200 employees, any one of those, as you said, could go off the rails. It's great that you're staying on top of that. And like, I hope everybody heard that because Jason runs a big firm, very busy, lots of people. 
So you small solo firm, you've got no excuse, no excuse not to be doing this. And it makes a huge impact. You're hundred percent right. All right. I want to talk about something else. Those footballs behind you. Now I know that you, <laughs> and if everybody could see your office, I know that there's pictures and, and, and all kinds of things. I know you're a big sports fan and a big green Bay Packers fan, right? Yes. And you guys Die do a lot of cool, cool sponsorship um, with the sports teams. You get a lot of opportunity to do that stuff. And basketball, like, if, it, you know, everybody should friend you on Facebook and see kind of like you out there with these, these uh, uh, basketball players and football players. I know that you hang out with them and play golf with them. That's pretty cool. That's a pretty good deal. I've been real lucky. I mean, as I said, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. But I'll tell you, one of the things since you, you can always buy yourself into an ability to go to a golf event with a player or do something. But one of the things that makes me feel just so lucky inside is the relationships I've been able to develop with people where it's more than just writing a check. Yeah, yeah. you're committed to their charity. But, you know, I'm super lucky to be able to call, you know, Donald Driver a really yeah. close friend. He's and, like a personal friend of yours. Yeah. And you know, it all starts out because you're, you have a common theme of a charity, but when they see you're real and respectful and they, they enjoy your mission and you enjoy their mission in a real way, you know, you're able to develop these relationships. And I have been so fortunate and so lucky to develop relationships with a lot of celebrities and stuff. And, and the best part about it is me being able to call them friends. I mean, if you, I know my daughter sometimes just, shakes her head when my Instagram post comes of something else crazy I'm doing and fun I'm doing. But, yeah. you know, I've just been very lucky. And if it wouldn't be for the hard work, to be honest, of so many people that work with me and have worked with me, I just wouldn't be able to do that. And, and again, I'm just so grateful and feel awesome about that ability to do that. And, and uh, just one tidbit, one of my all-time favorites was last year I got to play uh, Augusta right before the Masters. Uh, one of my close friends, Andy North, a two-time U.S. Open golf champion. He's from Madison, and and uh, I got to go with him and play. And um, it was I love golf. I'm a I'm a 15. Got a two time this afternoon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, and I got to do that right before the Masters, and that will be one of my all-time favorite memories. And we got to stay on the grounds actually, so we played the par three, had lunch in the clubhouse, played spent the night uh, on the grounds. And then the next morning there was a little frost. So as we're getting ready to tee off again, um, Dustin Rose comes in, one of the professional players and comes up to Andy. He's like, hey, Andy. And they're chatting and I look around and I look at his guest is Justin Timberlake. And so I got to spend the next 30 minutes just chatting with him. Oh, wow. And off we all went and, and played. And it that was, is it, is a, it is a memory I will never forget. And, uh, Times like this when we're all cooped up, it's nice for me to be able to just think about a couple of those things. I remember when you sent me a picture a couple of years ago when you were like, look who I'm with. And it was Cindy Crawford and yeah. her husband on it, going somewhere, you yeah. and your wife. We home. were with them having dinner in Malibu. Yeah, that was yeah. with Andy North as well. That was awesome. Well, listen, this doesn't come just by chance. That's the hard work, you know. And so you, I, all these years that I've known you, hardworking guy, Super humble, super nice, always been that way. And then here we are with this COVID-19 and the shit hits the fan. Yeah. And let me be honest about uh, that because yeah, I'll tell you, and, and in a real honest way, and, it, and it'll, you know, gets me, I'm getting a little teary-eyed right now even thinking about it. It was probably um, the worst week when things, and it really changed on a dime. I coincidentally happened to be in Europe, in Italy actually, right as things hit the fan in Northern Italy, because it was my daughter's 21st birthday. She was studying in Nice and we went out there to celebrate her birthday. And we celebrated actually her 21st birthday in Florence. And two days later, everything was shut down in uh, Northern Italy. And we were supposed to go to Northern Italy and the trip had to get shut, cut short. I come back a week later, I have to pull her out in the middle of the night uh, because uh, she had to come home with a travel ban. And then it just seemed like in a day, the world changed here in the United States. It literally was a day. And 
I had to make some unbelievably hard decisions. And it's the kind of decisions that a leader has to make to keep your company solvent. And, and I'm, I, I want people to understand that at that moment, we were a firm with no debt, no loans. All of our bills were paid up to the day fund everything in our own money. And all of a sudden the world changed and we had to make some hard decisions. And within three days I had to lay, I laid off uh, 85 people of my 200. And I told them that they were being laid off. People were potentially going to have to take the remaining, take pay cuts. I shut down 100% of our marketing budget, a hundred percent. And in most markets, we are the, number one TV spender in every market we're in. Because I could foresee a circumstance in a matter of a month where you go from a firm that has zero debt, but when you have 200 employees, 11 offices in three states, all of a sudden you can be in a real bind. Bigger isn't always better when you're in the middle of a pandemic. It can be quite scary. And, but it was a decision that had to be made in the short run to make sure I didn't all of a sudden have our firm in millions of dollars in debt it had never been in before. Never, never alone. Um, and we did that and it was a scary decision to make. It was sleepless nights. It was tears telling people and hearing and seeing these people that have done so much for my success. But it was with a commitment that we are gonna do everything we can to get you back and get you back quickly. And I'm excited enough to say, you know, that of those uh, people that were laid off, well over, well over half have already been brought back. And uh, more people are coming back on Monday and more people will be coming back in the weeks to come. But it's, it's different now. It's gonna be a different landscape. It's, it's scary and sad to say, but the world as I knew it uh, before, before everything changed, it just isn't gonna be the same. I think we'll probably be 25% smaller. Um, the weird situation for us having offices in three states is the differences that's been going on in the three states. Wisconsin had something called safer at home. Nice. Iowa had nothing. Illinois had shelter in place. The one good thing for us is law firms are essential businesses. So we have been able to work in our offices the whole time. We've never had to work remotely. The way our practice is set up, it would have been difficult for us to do that. We would have, I, I wouldn't have wanted everyone to work remote. I mean, we have some people working remote, but we collaborate, we have files, it's, you know, we have paperless stuff, but it just, it just isn't the same when you're not here collaborating with all of your people. So it was, it was a lot of tears. It was a lot of sleepless nights. Um, it's, I'm still, still tearful about it. You know, when, when I laid people off, to be honest, you know, I kind of just cried in my office about it. I felt so guilty. I was embarrassed. Um, it, it was- oh, You built terrible. this- this amazing firm, you built this thing up and through no, no fault of yours, no fault of theirs, no fault of anyone except this bizarre, you know, pandemic Yeah, uh, that, you know, we're told, oh, you got to you, you shut your business down. I mean, and, and for us as personal injury lawyers, when that happened, when all these shelter in place, safer at home, whatever, there's no one on the roads. As right. you, I'm sure in you're in Virginia, there's so few people out. What I'm hearing from all my other advertising people nationwide is that accidents are down 90%. Okay, well, what, that may not impact me right now for money, but it's going to impact you a year down the road. So you as a businessman, you have to think smart about not only what you're doing now, but what is the firm going to look like a year from now, 18 months from now. So you want to make really smart decisions now that keep you viable now, profitable now, and what are you, and also be thinking about what's going to happen. You know, for me, one of the biggest things I was doing right after I got through the first three weeks of the, oh my God, the sky is falling and figured that out. And I knew right then and there, I needed to do two things. I needed to generate as much revenue on the cases we have, make sure we're settling, getting them done. Court, courts are closed. Insurance companies are figuring out what they're doing. And then the next thing I had to do was get all the files out for settlement that the clients were ready. But that was frustrated because doctor's offices are closed. You can't get records. How do you get reports? But just try to muddle through all that. Well, we're through all that now. We weathered the storm. I knew we would come out the other end because we were so financially responsible. But what do you do now? You bring up a good point. Like, what do you do as a big firm with all these offices trying to reopen? The, the first thing we did is we really looked at 
marketing to our own employees and making sure that the hundred, I was down to maybe 110 at my lowest or 100 or 110. How do you make them feel safe and understand everything is going to be fine? It starts with me being a calm leader. And it was not easy because I didn't feel calm. I felt scared. I never felt scared, but I was scared. I was laying there at night scared. But you do everything you can to make sure that they feel good. We had hotline messaging all of a sudden. I set up a hotline that even laid off employees could call. I'd put updates on there. Um, we did uh, email and videos to clients. We did Skype conferences between all my offices. We developed something that we call the daily, where it's an email that goes out to all of our staff where uh, the people hearing won't be able to see this, but I, uh, I gave myself a buzz. My daughter gave me a buzz cut, did the COVID-19 cut. And so there's a picture, there'd be a picture of me with a bad haircut. You know, we had three stages of first with the buzz, trying to be at level three on the, on the buzz cutter and not doing it right. And I pu punches of hair here, buzz here. I looked ridiculous. Two days later, taking the number two and trying to smooth it out. And I look even sillier. And then finally, it was just like cut it all off. And so, you know, we, we had employees send in videos of their kids and dishes. And we have contests of people just to try to have when your people come in, just to be excited about something. Because this we're in Groundhog Day right now. Every day is yeah, Groundhog sure. Day. It stinks. Yeah. But you can never forget to really market your own employees. Make sure they feel comfortable. Let them know you're here. And uh, especially having to make the tough decisions. So now it's like, what do we do to, when do we turn on the budget? Uh, we're in a, I'm in a very unique position right now with the millions of millions of dollars we'd spend on advertising before COVID. Once you get to the level we are, you keep adding, 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 kind of subtracting very little. And at that point, you almost never know what's working because you're doing too much and you can't measure anything anymore. So now I'm taking this time to try to figure out, for example, with the help of you on pay-per-click, and the web and others on TV and, and, and trying to figure out what do we turn on and when. And I'm in a unique position now to be able to turn things on slowly because people aren't just gonna come back on the roads. You're not gonna all of a sudden, just because the government says we're open, doesn't mean anyone's gonna open. Doesn't mean people, all the festivals here are closed, sporting events aren't happening, restaurants aren't open. It's not like people are gonna be back on the road. So trying to figure out what works. I'm looking at my TV budgets. As I said, I'm the number one spender in every market I'm in but one. Um, trying to figure out how I put that on. How, how do I tweak pay-per-click with you and the web stuff? What uh, about, I just have a question because you know that um, uh, Bill Shatner is one of my, is one of my greatest <laughs> I do. I know you love Bill. Because of you that uh, I was introduced personally to him are you going to turn him on again? Are you still doing work with him? Or? Yeah, you know, thankfully right now, because we've been such a big advertiser, the, the stations are still running our ads for free. Yeah. Okay. Not 100%, but they're running our ads for free because they know we're going to turn back on. So Shatner is still, still out going. there. That guy is still going. He is, in his, in his late 80s. Rocket man. Burning out his fuse out here alone. Oh my God, he's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, you got to think about that. And, and I, another thing you have to think about is our approach now is going to be a softer sell. People are scared. You know, you got to understand and talk about what you're going to do for them. Um, more of work will come to you. Available 24-7, 365. You know, buzzwords, you know, we'll get you every dollar you deserve. But just kind of softer. And um, I think you just need to remind them of your brand. And, you know, as we've talked about and as I talked to Jill about early on and talked to you about early on when this when this shit hit the fan with all of this stuff is that people buy from people they like. That's the number one rule, no matter what. And so reminding them of Hupe and Abraham and reminding everybody on your list of how well that they were taken care of. And that, you know, you are their lawyers for life, no matter what. And so that, 
just like you said about referrals, they will refer six people if they had a good experience, if they had a bad experience, they're gonna tell a lot more people about the bad experience. So you just want to continue, and that that is a soft sale, that is reminding people of your brand over and over again. And you can do that in all those different uh, mediums. Yeah, and w one thing we've really done well with our marketing team here is understanding how to touch your former clients. Yeah. You know, when you have a, a client base like we do of 70,000 people, you know, you can do email blasts. Yeah. You, and we do client newsletters. We do biker uh, newsletters. We do texting campaigns. You guys do it all. Yeah. And another thing we do, which I think is important if you can do it, is we have a studio in-house. So um, I'm constantly in the studio when something comes up, um, if there's a new drug campaign um, that comes up, Zantac just came up, you know, I go right in the studio and film a video for the, for social media and get out there. It's, it's it, and I have great people in house that do it. It's not going to necessarily be TV quality, like my William Shatner commercials, but it's great for the web and it gets out there immediately. And none of my competition in the Midwest has the ability to do that. So if we just get, you know, a huge result, or if there's something, I just want people to know to make the community safer. Um, you know, one of the things we've been giving out to people are these things called buffs. I don't know if you know what that is. It's kind of a scarf that would go over your neck, but you can pull it up and it's like a oh, mask yeah. and you wear it on your bike. Yeah. yeah I've got we have Hubie and Abraham one and we've had them for That's years. Cool. And now we're, you know, now people want them like hotcakes because they can wear a mask. Well, I'll send you one. We okay. can wear them like a mask when we go to the store. Now, I, you know, on Monday, we're making sure everyone in the office is, you know, wearing masks. I bought masks for the staff. We're giving them buffs, you know, just, you know, just coincidentally, we have something that people would want in this buff that we could give away. And, you know, just staying on task, like you said, having people know you're here and let people know you care, I think. And when you're in the middle of a pandemic, something none of us could have ever imagined. I think when you let people know you care, you know, our, our message of giving back is even more important now in the pandemic than it was before. And- uh, Are you re-inspired with that, Jason? Are you, do you feel re-inspired? Yeah, you know, if I'm if I'm really being honest at this very moment, I just I feel a little tired, Tom. If I if I'm being honest, I mean, I I am now as passionate, if not more passionate, about what I do. But I'm I'm tired, you know. It's I took this hard, this this thing with my staff, and and having to lay people off in the short run and make hard decisions and and see tears and uh, you know that that you know it has struck a big time chord with me. Uh, I'm always going to be passionate. I'm here, you know, 5.36 in the morning and uh, I'm not staying as late as I used to anymore. But, you know, I am so passionate about my staff and so passionate about the clients. But at this very moment, I'm two things. I'm a little wore out. I'm tired of all the bickering amongst um, our political leaders. Yeah. I'm sad that we can't band together as a country and do what's in the best interest of the country and everything is so politicized and, and there's dishonesty and, and I'm just, I'm tired because I'm trying to do my part. You know, I'm trying to not only represent clients, represent my staff, but I'm trying to do what's right for you, Tom, in Virginia. And I'm trying to do what's right for people all over the world and all over the United States. I'm wearing my mask. I'm I'm doing this. I'm not going in public and taking a risk of infecting somebody else. And I, I just, I wish everyone else was doing the same because I, I think if we, if we reopen too quick and we try to get back too fast, we're just going to be back here again in a number of months. And, and that just would be even more demoralizing. And I, I just, I want to see everybody as committed to everybody else. You know, and yeah. I just think that's not the way of the world. Everybody is. wants it to open up, but just like yeah. you said, we don't want it to be at the expense of human lives. No, believe me, Tom, I am as tired of Groundhog Day yeah. as yeah. every other person there is out there. It stinks. But I, I, I want to do everything I can to keep you safe, me safe, my employees safe, my, my clients safe, my family safe. And, 
And I just well, think- and I know, you know, you and I have had many phone calls over the course of this. I talked to you when it first went down. I know how emotionally tolling this has been on you because I know what you've had to do building up this firm and what you had to do and the sacrifices. Um, and I just want to say, keep up the good fight. I mean, you know, the world needs leaders like you, Jason Abraham. And I appreciate you very much, not only as my friend, a client, of course. Um, I know that you guys are about to turn on the spigots again. And uh, we're going to see some great, probably a little bit more targeted, a little bit more focused stuff from Hubie and Abraham. But I want you to go, you know, please tell everybody over there that I haven't seen in a long time hello from me. And I hope to see you very soon. Personally, we'll do some elbow bumps. I think that's going to be the new way. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Better that than with our ankles. I can't do the ankle thing. I'm not good with that, like the soccer players are doing. I've never even heard of that one yet. So <laughs> I need the elbows. But, I, you know, Tom, I want to say this to you as well. I won't do business with people I don't like or that I wouldn't want to have o over to my house to have a beer or I wouldn't want at my daughter's wedding, or I just wouldn't want to go away with that a weekend, you know? And there are a lot of talented people in this world. And I'll tell you, you are a talented person and I value even more than the work we do together, the friendship we've developed. And I can tell you, no matter who I do business with, whether it be my TV people, my bank, the person that does the electric at my house, if, if I don't, like you or I don't respect you. I can't do business with you. And you are someone that I completely respect. And I just love you as a person. And when I see you right now on Zoom with your facial hair, I have a huge smile on my face right now. And I That's can't wait. Ernest Hemingway. Yeah, I can't wait to see you. But I am just so grateful, Tom, for our friendship. And the work goes without saying. Your people are so talented, but your friendship for me means so much. And you know, I've called you when times were rough. And I've asked things of you when times were rough and I'll never forget it. And I'm grateful and keep up the good work. And together, we're going to keep passionately doing what we do, making a difference in this world. Well, thank you, Jason. You're going to get me misty. I love you, man. Oh, oh. But I appreciate you so much, too, and your friendship. I mean, it's 10 years and going, 11 years and going. Yeah. And uh, we'll keep it going. And I will see you soon. And I will talk to you sooner. And uh, I appreciate your time here. And I hope that everybody has learned a great deal from this. And I know that they can reach out to you and talk. You're a very, you're open guy. You'll talk to anybody and mentor. Anybody. Yeah. Anybody. Okay. Thanks, bud. Thank you, Jason. Everybody, it's Tom Foster and the man, Jason Abraham, and the world of marketing. We'll see you soon.